times. Uh, indeed, like all of us now are Zoom fatigued. It has been one Zoom to another Zoom to another Zoom, but we appreciate that you have spared your time to join us uh, today in this conversation uh, on action equalization. Um, and before uh, we start to, to dive into the action equalization, uh, I would really like to, uh, to, to test our temperature on action equalization and how much we know about the action equalization. Um, so I would really like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Paul, and I encourage all the uh, participants to check um, to be part of this call. Uh, just feel confident and comfortable to uh, to click in on the option that reflects your reality. Uh, and again, this is the safe space. Um, it's, uh, it's a feminist space. It's your space. And we really wanted to, before we share with you what we want to speak, it's important to get the reflection from all of you on where we are in terms of our understanding and our knowledge and experience about action coalition in Beijing uh, generation equality processes. So, Rachel, uh, if you can launch the poll, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mishi. Um, and here we go. Without much further ado, I just did. And I just want to find out from us whether you can see that on your screen. Are you able to see a poll? And you can just respond with, you know, the, the, the questions, yes and no. Yes, I see. I see we are now polling. So we'll give ourselves like a minute um, just so that we have as many people um, being able to share their perspectives and their responses to the poll. Yes, I see. I see about eight of us. There are about 31 in our... In our <laughs> In our call this afternoon, so let's let's keep let's keep um, um, responding. I like what Mishi reminded us that this is a safe space, um, and and the purpose of our poll is just for us to be able to gauge our know-how, um, how much do you know about the action coalition, and every answer is correct, even when we don't know that is a correct answer. Great, I see we are at 16 now. So a few seconds, just a few seconds, and then we'll be ending the poll. And I'll be able then just to display the results from our poll. And just to add up for, uh, from what Rachel said, specifically on the question number three, if you think uh, you need to uh, share more explanation on the question number three, please feel free to, to do that on the chat so that we also get a sense of um, where are we in terms of the uh, understanding in the national action related to action coalition. So kindly use the chat box to provide any additional uh, clarification that we think is necessary uh, to be Yeah, yeah. And in the spirit of leave no one behind, <laughs> I see 25 of us have already responded. So just give it a couple of seconds for the few more, the few more. I think about six of us, um, but no pressure, no pressure. I think just to give you, I think I'll just start my countdown of 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and the drums roll and we end our poll. I don't know whether Mishi, you can see the results. I can, I can see the result. Uh, uh, luckily, 72% uh, of uh, participants in this room, they know about Action Coalition. Only 28% they don't know about Action Coalition. Uh, in terms of how much do they know about Action Coalition, uh, only 32%, they feel that they know between 50 to 70%. So they know quite a bit. 44%, uh, they say they know just a bit. That is below uh, 49%. And we have 24% said we don't know at all. 
And I think that uh, is what this meeting in, uh, is sort of um, to fill that communication gap and to get all of us to speed. But also in regards to question number three, um, uh, Thirty-two percent. They said uh, they know about the ongoing dialogue, dialogue and awareness within the country, but significant number of us, sixty-eight percent, they don't know of any ongoing dialogue or activities or awareness in the specific country. And I do think uh, that is a little bit concerning that. 68% of us that uh, we have no knowledge, potentially that might reflect the reality that this conversation might not be happening at the country level. And that's why it's important to have this conversation today. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you a lot for, uh, for the poll. And um, I would now, uh, without further ado, to uh, welcome you again to the conversation. We felt, we felt this is important before we dwell in what the action coalition uh, is and what the process and specifically what economic act, uh, economic justice action coalition is, we just have a clear picture of where we are. And I thank you for all participating and accord us your experience and knowledge. I am Moana Hamisi Singano, you can call me Mishi. I'll be moderating this session today, uh, supported by my colleague, Rachel Kagoya, who will be, uh, joining in at some point but also she uh, she's playing a critical role on the back end to to our technology work for us i would uh, now welcome my uh, colleague uh, memory kachamboa to first introduce yourself second to welcome you again as a uh, feminine executive director but third to uh, make a presentation about action coalition uh, as memory joining, uh, I would really like to again encourage colleagues, uh, sisters and brothers to use the chat box to, uh, for example, to, to put down any question that you might have about Action Coalition, specifically for those who say they know a bit, uh, they know less. Let's use the chat to share your question, your concern, what you don't know, what confuses you, so that in the course of the one hour and a half that will be here, we will be making attempts to respond to as much uh, as question as we could, because we wanted to get out of this space, at least with that uh, majority of us know at least a bit about Action Coalition, specifically about Economic Justice Action Coalition. So welcome, Memory, and welcome all participants to share your question of concern, and again, listen to Memory attentively. Memory, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mishi, and welcome. It's always great when we are together and we're able to just connect with FemNet members. Um, it's been quite a lot, there's been a lot happening around action coalitions and it's so good to see from the poll that most of you have a bit of an idea and um, so in case I tell you what you already know, just please forgive me and actually add on if, if there's other information that you might have. So myself, I'm also glad to say on this call, we have Zone, who is also part of the Global Civil Society Advisory Group to the core group of the action, Global Action Coalitions. So I'll go straight into my presentation. So it will be just giving you a quick overview of what the Action Coalitions is all about. And then specifically, um, just talking a little bit about our role in the Action Coalition. Uh, FEMNET was, is one of the core leaders of the Action Coalitions on Economic Justice and Rights. And essentially this meeting, as already alluded to, is to just hear from you. Uh, we don't know everything as FEMNET, so that's the disclaimer. I think we just want to just open up this session to be interactive, to hear from you. What are your expectations? What role can we play? what role do you want to play and what should we also be um what sort of information can we share and join with the global community so i'll go straight into my presentation and whilst i present please feel free to if you have any questions to just put the questions in the chat thank you
I'll go into presentation mode. Um, I do hope everyone can see this. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes, we okay. can. Fantastic. I know the color is red, so red usually is a bit um, not the best of colors. Um, but okay, so um, based on the human rights principles, the action coalitions is part of what is called the generation equality. And I'm sure most of you, as you indicated on the poll, you do know about the generation equality action coalition, which is um, really building up on the Beijing plus 25 process. So it's also based on human rights principles. It's about, um, it's, it's been developed through a consultation with international feminist groups, uh, grassroots activist organizations, governments and other partners. And the action coalitions are six. So the first one is gender-based violence. The second one, economic justice and rights. The third one, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights. The fourth one, feminist action for climate justice. The fifth one, technology and innovation for gender equality. And the sixth one, feminist movements and leadership. Um, there is also talk to have another one on women, peace and security. And what is currently there is a task force. So these are the, um, Generation Equality Action Coalitions as they stand, there are six. Okay, so what are action coalitions? So these are multi-stakeholder partnerships that will mobilize governments, civil society, international organizations and private sector to catalyze collective action, to spark global and local conversations among the different generations. So it's looking at the, the older generation and the young generation to be able to take forward the torch, the torch of um, the Beijing for action. It's also to drive increased public and private investments into gender equality and women's rights and also to deliver concrete game-changing results across generations for girls and women. So this is what the action coalitions are all about. And starting from last year, we've really been seeing how uh, we've been, the UN Women has, has um, set itself as, as a secretariat for driving these action coalitions. So they are very ambitious. Um, they have got targets. There will be though their term for this action coalition will be five years, starting from next year, 2021 to 2026. And the bottom line is to deliver very tangible impact on gender equality and women's human rights, as well as to ensure that there is financing and concrete results that will address the systemic resource gaps that we know. In, in all the work that we have done on gender equality, the resource gap has been really, really, really glaring. So the goals are to advance new partnerships. We also know that the multi, the multinational, the multilateral system has also become, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's been shrinking more and more. So this is a new kind of platform to advance platforms with um, the governments, with civil society, with private sector, and also with the other international organization on gender equality. And they are very specific to, have to be very targeted al along the six thematic area. And there will be progress annually in terms of performance and what sort of change is happening. So this is how would these um, action coalitions accelerate a transformative agenda for generational change. So it's believed that um, these action coalitions with the participation of the different groups who result in tangible results on financing that's investment in gender equality and women's rights, transforming uh, gender norms, this includes engaging men and boys, law and policy reform, uh, advancing education, the issue around gender data and accountability, and also addressing intersectional discrimination. We've seen um, the intersection of discrimination along race, along age, along um, 
disability. So bringing together all those intersections, but really focusing on making systemic changes by also addressing some of the structural inequalities that we know um, have been persistent and per pervasive in the work on advancing gender equality and women's rights. So cutting across will be issues of um, if, if look, looking at the fragile and the conflict uh, affected um, context, also looking at the centrality and making sure that adolescent girls and women are at the heart of this multi-generational um, uh, platform. So how will these action coalitions be developed? So there will be, so this has already been happening. There'll be a, blue, a blueprint of each action coalition. And this blueprint will include the rationale for why this theme was selected. There'll be a set of concrete actions that will unite the diverse efforts and really uh, deliver what we are calling game-changing uh, results. There'll be principles to inform each action coalition what exactly uh, will this action coalition drive. And there'll be also a financial analysis to say how much resources will we really need uh, in terms of delivering these results in, within this action coalition. And then there'll be commitments. So the commitments will be global, will be regional, and they'll also go down to the national to make sure that there is progress at both levels. And then there'll also be accountability framework and annual success goal posts, including annual reporting in terms of what are the actions and how are these being measured? And also just the general principles as a whole. And how would this operate? Like I said before, this will be convened by UN women with the support of also the other UN, uh, UN women's um, uh, processes and the other agencies. The leadership of each action coalition will be led by a group of partners. So already they have the partners have been selected and the partners were announced. And these partners are very diverse and inclusive from the global south, the global north, um, youth, uh, also UN agencies, uh, philanthropic organizations, governments, as well as youth leaders. So this is the leadership. And then there'll be members, there'll be a membership of the, of the Action Coalition, which will be open to all the ones, to every other organization or other partners who meet um, the membership criteria. So that's just an overview of the Action Coalitions, what they are, how they are envisioned to, to, to operate. So now I'll just speak about the economic justice and Rights Action Coalition, the one which we as Femnet are one of the core leaders. So just overall, there have been 65. So initially, the process so far is that there have been Action Coalition leaders across the six thematic areas. These were already announced. And I'm sure most of you might, would have seen the list of the different organizations coming from the Global South. In Af Africa only has three three organizations. So that's FEMNET, that's Pan-African Climate Justice and Rights, which is under the Feminist Climate uh, Justice. And then there's Gender Links, which is on the feminist movement building. So from Africa, there are only three organizations that so far have been selected as leaders of these action coalitions. There's also a process which is currently going on for youth leaders. So we are hoping that uh, within the, the youth leaders who are going to join each of the six action coalitions, because initially when this call was sent out, it wasn't very clear to everyone and to different organizations what was required. And there was a huge, huge gap in terms of youth and women led organizations. So a call was set out and the applications were reviewed so we hope within the next uh, few weeks, we'll be getting announcements of which of the youth leaders have been successful in joining and in leading the six um, action coalitions. Okay, so like I mentioned, um, the economic justice and rights, this is the current structure. So when you look at the member states, 
We have Germany, Mexico, South Africa, Spain, and Sweden. So these are the member states. Then international organizations, we have OECD, which is the international organizations and UN, UN agencies. We've got the UN Nations Capital Development Fund. This is actually a new agency within the UN, but it has, uh, it looks a lot at issues on economic, um, economic justice and mostly macroeconomics as well. And the philanthropic partner is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And civil society, we have five civil society organizations. We have K International, we have FemNet, we have Wiru Commission, and we have IT International Trade Union Confederation and Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. The Women's Working Group on Financing for Development, um, for some that might have an idea, we work with them um, on, on the SDGs, Financing for Development in Addis, uh, if you know about the Addis, um, the, 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 the Addis meeting, which actually came with uh, specific recommendations on Financing for Development. So this is the current structure for economic justice and rights. Now, demystifying the action coalition process. So I borrowed this from an exercise which was done. And these are some of the questions um, when they were presenting to the different constituencies on what are some of the actions around these action coalitions. And the whole exercise today is interactive today to get questions from you but i thought would share some of uh some of the questions that have been asked on how can other csos join as members what are the opportunities that currently exist to influence the action coalitions uh commitments as non-leaders uh, so those are some of the questions that came out to quickly say on this on this question is so different civil society organizations, currently the criteria for them to join as members is not yet out. So we still like, like I said, the, the disclaimer, we don't know everything, but um, the core group and the civil society group and the advisory group and the different groups are coming together to see what exactly is going to be used um, for membership. So this is still something that is still not clear. So we hope we'll be able to know. But nonetheless, there are so many opportunities. So one of the opportunities, for example, is working with, or with the leaders who are already in the action coalition groups. So for example, as FemNet, uh, there are also other different partners, even if we don't have, um, you know, we are not leading on gender-based violence, there are still partners within the Gender-Based Violence Action Coalition that can be used to influence. So what has happened is that some groups have come together and said, okay, under gender-based violence, this is what we want to see in the blueprint. And they've already presented that and submitted it to the, to the core group. So this is one way, even if you are not a leader, even if you are not uh, part of the civil society organizations, you can influence any of the six action coalitions okay another question is around where would they where would they be participation at mexico and france generation equality meetings so one thing that i omitted when i was talking about the action coalition is that the process which will be my next slide where i'll share that they're going to be gender equality forums Initially, we're supposed to have them this year, but of course with COVID, it wasn't possible. So there'll be a generation equality for a meeting in Mexico and also in France. Uh, in Mexico, it will be around March and in France, it will be in May. But we are not yet sure whether those dates will continue. Um, you know, everything nowadays is we have to wait and we have to see what is the situation. What are the best ways to support and provide input? This question we hope to also hear from you uh, in terms of, um, you know, what are some of the ways, you know, uh, for providing input. But as FemNet, we are also open to work with you and to hear from you as the membership in terms of, um, you know, what are some what are some of the issues that you want us to support with, to raise, and how can we collectively 
be part of the action coalition process. So how would we connect with the different action coalition process? I think I answered this question. How can we show outreach to specific constituencies and, com and communities? So we have very, we have already uh, as part of this interactive session, uh, our members who also share what they are doing on the ground and what already, you know, processes they've already thought around this action coalition. So they can also share in terms of the specific outreach. But we are also open to hear, and also we, we actually want to hear more from you as our members on what are some of the things we can do for the reach out. And then what are the next steps for the action coalitions and how will civil society be engaged? So this takes me to my next slide. And this is a slide which was shared by UN Women. So the process is so far is each of the action coalitions they have had different workshops and within these workshops they have actually defined um, the vision and as well as already started thinking around the coalitions, what each action coalition will focus on. But we are coming to, to our membership to say, we, this is the process so far, but we also need your input so that as we as we progress, we also progress collectively. We are also able to, where possible, to catalyze and to also support in terms of linking with the other action coalitions. But really the bottom line is just to break it down, just to demystify what this action coalition is about and how we can really, you know, Africa women's movement is known as being robust. So this is something that we really want to make sure within the continent, we are really taking advantage of, we are moving with it, and we really make sure our voices are heard at all platforms. So the 1st of July is when the announcement for the leadership was made. On the 8th of July, um, all the way up until September, there were Action Coalition's workshops, like I mentioned, one was already done. Another one is set for August for economic justice and rights, and also for the other ones. And then in September, there is going to be a global citizen event. So this will be an event which will engage with the broad public on the Action Coalition's vision and success, and also for the blueprints. So it's expected that between August, September, the process of developing the blueprints will be done. The 1st of October, there's going to be a high level meeting of the General Assembly. So this is, this is going to be a high level meeting which will also profile um, the COVID-19 actions in the action coalitions, um, as well as um, it should be also a high level meeting being organized by UN Women, which will bring together um very uh the governments and different partners as well so from september to october there'll be virtual different public engagements um all the way to next year march so the mexico forum is expected the first part of 2021 so this is to be confirmed between maybe january and march and then there will be also membership structures engagement and in the Paris forum uh, it's expected maybe round about July, where there'll be the official launch of the action coalitions by the head of states and international organizations. So the forum in Mexico is mostly is, is, is for civil society, where this will be the meeting to really uh, look at the blueprints and to work through and say, these are the key actions we want this is how we want it to look. These are the results. So this will be driven by civil society. And like I said, uh, there is a call which for youth-led organizations applications. So we expect already uh, as part of the leadership structure to have additional um, youth organizations. And there's an ongoing women, peace and security uh, task force to complement the action coalitions. And I would also invite, I think from Africa, we need more voices on people who are working on, on women, peace and security. All right, so I've just come to the end. And I think uh, even as we end, I think there are certain questions that I would also like to pose. And in our interactive session, when we go into the groups 
I will be also answering in terms of, you know, what kind of transformation do you want to see? Um, what do you hope to come from this process? And how would you like to be engaged and to engage in this process? So thank you so much. I'm open for questions. And with, of course, the disclaimer that, you know, this we will answer as far as we can. We don't have UN women here who are part of the core group, but I'm also, like I mentioned, we also have Zoni, and I'm not so sure whether Felista or other members from the civil society uh, core group have also joined. So thank you so much, and over to you, Rachel and Mishi. Thank you, Memory. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Memory, for, for a detailed presentation. I think before we go to question and answer, and again, I would really like to, uh, to encourage uh, uh, participants to share their, their comments and, 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 and question on the chat um, so that we, we don't uh, we save time. But I would like to welcome Zone and Dr. Sfo to just add up to what Memory said in terms of giving their, uh, their own perspective. So I would like to welcome first Zoni, who would speak and compliment what Memory said. And then we'll go to Dr. Asfo, who will, um, will, will speak a bit on, on specifically on economic justice. Zoni, if I can, good, can, can give you the floor, please. Thank you so much, Mishi, and thanks so much, Memory. Uh, sorry, I will not be able to put on my video because of the bad internet. Uh, again, I will just key on to what Memory has said. I think Memory has done a good job by uh, giving us already a, an outline and a very detailed roadmap of when it all started and where we are at the moment. I will just zoom into how we within the Central African region are also contributing to the whole general conversation and seeing how that also fits into the work that FEMNET is also doing. So uh, within the, gen uh, the Central African region, which is constituted of countries like Cameroon, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, DRC, Congo Brazzaville, and Angola, so far we've been able to mobilize women across five of these countries. The only two countries that are still, we've not been able to get mass mobilization and actions leading towards generation equality is Gabon and, and Angola. And the method has been local and grassroots led. And uh, we've been using Zoom to meet regularly to discuss on strategies and tactics on how to reach out to the underdeserved communities and also constituencies that are completely, completely not aware of what is happening because from the pool we could see that uh, less than 25% are aware of what is actually action coalition and what is generation equality. And the UN has as a mandate to ensure that no one is left behind in this conversation. And as women's rights organizations as well, we also have as a responsibility to see that voices from the grassroots, especially from this continent, are part of this conversation because in most of these spaces, we often tend not to be actively involved in these spaces. And it's important that in times like this, we definitely take leadership and, and a leading role. So one of the activities I would just which I think it's a milestone was was the meeting we had with members of parliaments. I believe in most of our countries, the parliaments, members of parliaments have a very strong role in terms of pushing policies and pushing agendas. And here in Cameroon, early this year, there was an election and of the 108 seats of members of parliament, 60 female members of parliament, to see how the next five years would carry in their action plan elements of uh, generation equality and action coalition. 
And the, the advocacy meeting was quite a success in, in, in a way that we're able to get the Speaker of the National Assembly a list present at the meeting and also the, the, the Vice President of the Network for Female Parliamentarians also present at the meeting together with the Minister of Women's Empowerment. So those were some of the high profile members who were in that meeting. And then after the meeting, we had, we've been having working sessions with these secretariats at the Parliament, at the uh, National Assembly. And we've been able to come up with an action plan, which now is part of the five year mandate. I would say, of, of this, one of the successes of uh, pushing the generation equality agenda forward and making it be part of a national conversation. That is in Cameroon. In, 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 in TRC, we also had our members who were able to mobilize locally. And July last month, they held a meeting together, which was participated also by their Minister of Gender. And in, in Equatorial Guinea, similar also in Chad. So what I'm trying to say is how movements are built at the grassroots level and it's able to influence policy at the national level. And it's a hope that as member of FEMNET, it would not just only limit at the national level, but will be able to carry on this conversation at the regional level and at the global level. And also serve as an accountability check for for our government in terms of their commitment was ensuring that women's rights be part of their program. I'm just trying to zoom it to the least, you know, comprehensive way that I could. I hope uh, what I've explained it's it's clear, but if it's not clear, I shared in the in the chat group links to some of the works that has been done in the Central African region and how that also fits to what FEMNET does and how that also is part of the whole global conversation in terms of generation equality. Thank you. Thank you so much Zone for, uh, for uh, giving us a detail of what is happening at, at the regional level but also at the country level. Um, I have, I recognize a hand from Tafatsua and Crystal. Uh, I will give you um, um, an opportunity to, resp to ask your question and share your feedback after Dr. Asfor has uh, given her, um, her experience as well. Dr. Asfor, we have the floor and meanwhile, uh, kindly uh, put in a question in the chat as well. Thank you very much. I am so happy to join you in this very important uh, meeting and uh, about economic justice and uh, economic rights as a FEMNET member, Egyptian Business Women Association and uh, international president of uh, business and professional women and also the chair for trade promotion committee of Commercial Business Council and the vice president of Pan-African Committee for Trade and Investment. I am so happy to join you today uh, in, to just give highlights and overview of the current situation which is happening now in, in Africa and how can we really promote the economic justice and rights within different uh, uh, different levels. Can I ask to share the screen, please? <coughs> so, oh, okay, that is the, uh, sorry. Uh, one moment, I just have to, I'm coming, hello? Uh, okay, sorry. I just started from the last thing, so uh, I have to, I have to go through the whole thing. Sorry. I am just, I, I just came out now of, uh, of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area handover which is uh, by uh, President Tana of Ghana. And this shows really how can we as, uh, as a coalition make sure that there is a political will with reference to our, uh, our, uh, our uh, agenda for uh, uh, economic justice and, uh, and, uh, and, human, uh, and, uh, and rights. So if we're taking the whole agenda of the UN of sustainable development goals and how economic justice and rights would really contribute to this agenda. 
Uh, we will, and also within the guiding vision of the Africa 23 development agenda, the Africa we want, which is an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa driven by the citizens of Africa. And we understand that we are the citizens of Africa as women. We are the citizens of Africa and we are the one to really show how we have a prosperous Africa through our education, our entrepreneurship, our financial independence, our access to land and property, our training and capacity building, which considers the major cap, uh, thing. So our strategy for economic empowerment is really about awareness and building the, the, the whole uh, culture of entrepreneurship, the access to information, the lobbying and advocacy for better legislation for the, for the for the economic justice and rights and of course access to training and capacity building so i have really listed a summary of the economic justice and rights with reference to women entrepreneurship women trade and access to market women on board women financial inclusion women equal pay women in stem education women in digital economy and innovation, women empowerment principles, government and corporate procurement and access to land and property. If we see the whole ecosystem for women economic empowerment and entrepreneurship promotion, we find that the real empowerment and economic empowerment of women is really about the potency, the capacity to act and to implement. So how we as a coalition have the real potency and the capacity to make legislation, to advocate with, uh, with political leaders and to implement the strategic workshop uh, work uh, programs and implement also the Africa 23 development agenda to implement the ACFTA and to make an impact on the whole and the whole uh, uh, or our African uh, women. So if here we have this, I call it the, the triad of empowerment which really based on three pillars, the personality and have personal empowerment programs, how economic empowerment of women through building capacity of our women entrepreneurs, through having them access to banks, to having them register their companies, having them know all the rules of the ACFTA, how can this impact our cross-border women traders, our women-owned SMEs? How can she deal with bank? How she has all the information? How she access tenders? The second pillar is about the policy and the procedure. What policy in place we have to have the legislation for, for the economic justice and rights, like government procurement, like financial inclusion, like one-stop shop, like having ACFGA, like the customs official when we have cross-border women traders, all this policy, how can we really lobby for it? And then product development. If we really want to have an economic empowerment for women, economic justice, we need to have products that are standards, that are value added with reference to our women entrepreneurs. So how to really achieve this? This is, I call it the center of empower the circle of empowerment economic justice is awareness popularization is also about raising the women in the entrepreneurial culture with democratic uh, uh, at home it is about how it, how we make sure that there is education capacity building training young entrepreneurship promotion and building an entrepreneurial culture access to financial resources access to technology and information technical assistance and support services advocacy and project development if we talk about this, then we as a coalition may have to make sure that we have to lobby the governments and we as civil society organization, we have to, uh, to train and uh, the lobby for that. We have the private sector involvement, academia and the media to give the message. In the awareness and entrepreneurial culture, I just shared with you some stories like young women as job creator, where uh, for in Egypt we go to, to the universities and we give business models and success stories for women, for, uh, for, uh, for, for the young entrepreneurs, we give them mentorship program, we give them business ideas. And then to change the whole building, the entrepreneurial culture, we are working on three things. For the economic justice, we need to start for the family for entrepreneurship promotion. And the first S is the society. Second is, uh, S is the school. If we as a coalition working for having economic justice rights, we need to have uh, embed this in the curriculum of the schools of all our African continent for the, the and then the state. We have to lobby with the states. So in, uh, in uh, advocacy and lobbying for better legislation, we need to have a political will. And this is very important to tell you how the story have with this. I have been addressing the heads of states as chair of Commerce Business Council at the heads of states where I have asked them to have a special percentage for our government procurement to go to SMEs, women, youth and people uh, and uh, women and youth. So in Kenya, it has been implemented since several years. 
uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta has picked up on that, and 30% now as present in, 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 in Kenya for government procurement. I've also been lobbying with all the heads of states, like her excellent president, uh, former president of Liberia, first lady of Ghana, first lady of Namibia, with all the presidents of President of Ghana, Museveni, President of Namibia, President Nana of Ghana, Her Excellency, the former President of Mauritius. So all these really have been uh, very successful because as we are uh, showing how the challenges of women access to trade, like product development, like presentation, like pricing, like popularity, like payment, like posting, which is really about our infrastructure, how we now make shipping for our, uh, during our intra-Africa trade, or having the proper information for the products and trade agreements and women entrepreneurs and the, to really empower the women to achieve and lead. So this about women empowerment in trade and access to market, there is the initiative of sheet trades of ITC. That's why we link with UN agencies like ITC to make sure that global sheet trades, which have the champion of quality data, the fair policies, the government procurement and strike business deals. Uh, so it is important also to link with international AU or uh, 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 UN or agencies and now I just I was just telling you I just now left the the handover of the of the Afri Africa continental free trade area secretariat and President Nana was just half an hour ago giving a presentation to all of us in Africa that ACTF, Africa Continental Free Trade Area, which is the biggest free trade area in the world, how will this impact all our people in Africa? And I have been really lobbying of how this could have an impact on uh, to have a strong African product with international and regional standards so we are able to promote our uh, African products made in Africa, have value addition to our raw material, to have industrialization, and how really this ACFTA will have also, we have launched with uh, on the 7th of July, the Sukuku Africa. Sukuku Africa is the digital economy and the platform of all our African products, where it's like our Alibaba or our Amazon. How does this Sukuku Africa and the Africa Continental Free Trade Area really have an impact on the daily life of our women entrepreneurs, our cross-border women traders, how we have an African product that we can really work on it. And then government and corporate procurement policy. It is very important to know that government procurement, we have $15 trillion across the whole world, government procurement, we even have access only to 1%. So how can we shift this? How can, uh, I, we have been lobbying with in at the UN at CSW with, uh, with our Minister of Gender of, uh, from Egypt and another four ministers from Africa for gender procure, for, for public procurement. As you say this, I was addressing the heads of states with Comesta and I am so happy today to share with you that according to this law, lobby advocacy that I have been doing as a member of FEMNET, President Ramaphosa of South Africa in his acceptance speech of African Union this uh, this year, he said that at least 30% of all uh, uh, public procurement in the African Union member states will be for women entrepreneurs. And just two days ago, on the uh, last week, on the on the on the eighth, has been announced that 40% public procurement to women-owned businesses in South Africa. What a success story! What a fantastic lobbying that we have now within our African continent. If we really work together as a coalition across Africa and the whole world to have 40% uh, of public procurement to women on businesses, then we see how this economic justice will go, how this will really go. So it uh, also, if we talk about economic justice, corporate procurement, you know that all the big companies across the world have really put some aside for the to, uh, to source from women uh, uh, from women vendors. At Comesa Business Council, we have been doing a project to source from local vendors. <coughs> So we made big agreements with big corporates to source from women vendors they are uh, to from SMEs. So they asked us that this SMEs has to be trained to have a product which is standard and meet the quality. So we train we, we train 480 SMEs every year in order to make sure where BBW Egypt Business and Professional Women Egypt Egyptian Business Women Association are members of it, which is members of Femnet, to see how we, we train our women. And now these women have been trained to export and 
and to have quality product to have the interregional integration. So this is a corporate procurement that we are doing. Also with reference to financial inclusion, we are very happy that President Ramaphosa of South Africa in his acceptance speech have declared the African Women Decade for Financial Inclusion 2023. It's very important to understand that the financial inclusion and allocation for fund and access to, trade, uh, to credit to women and youth and startups with promoting financial institution and how to have simple digital payment solution. This is very important because simple digital payment solution is really about no, leaving no women behind. How can a woman from her mobile have a inter, a make a, all the, 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 the trade, between, not only within the country like mobile wallets or like M-Pesa, but across countries, which is interoperability across countries. How can a woman, a trader, an owner of SMEs, for instance, from Egypt, trade with Zambia, from Zimbabwe to Djibouti, from Djibouti to Ethiopia, from, uh, from, from Senegal to Nigeria. This is really about the framework, the regulatory framework that we need to see how we have this regulatory framework work together in order to make sure that the, 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 the telecommunication companies, the, 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 the central banks, the financial institution, telecommunication companies, the women organization, alliances and organization for financial inclusion, make sure have a global partnership of financial inclusion. All of us make the regulatory framework to make sure that the financial inclusion is always there for our women for intra-Africa trade. We also, so this is really about the policy to advocate for regulatory framework for financial inclusion of women, the product to advocate for special tailored financial products that would suit the sectors and levels of women and the build the capacity of our women entrepreneurs. So we make financial inclusion affordable, accessible and appropriate and make sure that we have promotion and use of technology. Okay. I am so happy to have uh, said, just sent you, uh, uh, made uh, this presentation for you and this is uh, that one was done in Tunisia for financial inclusion and in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, for, uh, fin uh, uh, Saudi Arabia for fi uh, global financial inclusion. And these are uh, the fourth pillar is about training capacity building for rural women. As you can see, this is in the south of Egypt, how we are training and also linking women with science and technology for green economy and clean energy with reference to solar dryers. As you see, this is a, a solar dryer for small, small farmer to domestic use where they can dry five kilogram of tomato. <laughs> COVID-19 threatened. So, and this um, is Dr. Uh, for, uh, Dr. Yes. for if I may just ask you to kindly wind. Yeah, and, that's what I am doing. I, am saying, I would just like to, I would just like to wind up here to say that it's very important that we use our coalition to make sure that we have the policy, the personal empowerment program, the project development, and uh, the, the innovation mapping exercise for the available resources, training capacity building, promoting entrepreneurship, and partnering with private sector and with regional international programs. Thank you very much. That has been, uh, I hope you just, uh, so, uh, and uh, I hope you just saw uh, how we are, we as a coalition, make sure that together we can make it for economic justice and economic rights and how are the pillars with reference to even our political will with financial inclusion and government procurement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Asfour, and I think you've given us a test of the, the work that is happening at, at, at country level, but also with the other platforms. Uh, just to catch up with time, uh, Tafaso, she's just about to leave and she wanted to make her point. If you can have the floor, and then you take uh, additional one more question, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Rachel, who would lead us and moderate the second segment. So, Tafaso, you have the floor, please. And then follow up by Crystal. All right. Hello, Mishi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sisters, and congratulations for hosting this event. Um, many thanks to Doc. I just wanted to put my comments. Can you hear me? I'll try to be as brief as I can. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I think for me, um, the Action Generation Coalition is, is an exciting uh, platform for us to be able to um, engage with the private sector and to seek transparency and accountability on outstanding uh, women's rights abuses. 
But I think, as usual, I feel, I personally feel that we have now, uh, we are now joining this um, coalition whilst the train has already moved on. So it would have been good if we, as African women, had been broadly engaged so that at least we really define our narrative, we agree on the fundamental principles of inclusion and leaving, not leaving anyone behind. So, so for me, the, the, the onset, I'm really, I, I'm really hoping that our narrative as African women will be put um, when, when Feminet engages with other partners around the issue of expro expropriation of our natural resources. Th that argument is not really coming out through, especially when we note the multinational companies uh, in collaboration with the political elite who are taking away land, minerals, oil and gas and timber and wildlife, which the African women really are the custodians of those natural resources. So we cannot speak of economic justice without ensuring that we push for a firm framework that will force the private sector to be accountable for the women's rights uh, for the women's economic rights violation so i think that needs to be that, that needs to be strengthened and then the second thing how are we feeding into already existing policy frameworks which adoc has already mentioned the agenda 2063 the maputo maputo protocol and others as well we need to harness those energies as well well, and also, lastly, um, we, we, we really need to work with already existing uh, other feminists and academics that are working on economic rights that have done extensive work on the, Af on the Africa that we need to see in as, ma in as far as the economic justice is concerned. So I also feel that uh, we, we need to, 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 to harness those energies and also to so that at least it's not like we are repeating, but we, we are building on something that is already there. Um, and also, is there an opportunity for us at country level to work with the UN Women Country Offices? Are they already on board? Um, thank you so much, Anisha. I have to go. I look forward to receiving the outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, you really raised a lot of uh, good points, and I think it is specifically for that to explore ideas on how are we going to engage with other existing partnership what is the new thing that we need to do but also what are the existing framework that we need to uh, to push on uh, or to leverage um, etc so I think thank you for so much for the ideas I would now wish to give it to Crystal uh, to share her comment and I think if there's anyone I'll take one more if there's anyone who wants to raise a point, please raise your hand and please pick up the floor. Thank you and hello everyone. This is Crystal Simeone, former Feminet. Um, I am now director of a new collective called NAWI that's working on macroeconomic policy from a pan-African feminist perspective. I, I take from Tafatwa, I just am not as excited as her about the action coalition for a number of fundamental issues. I think the first one for me is if you look at the partners of the Economic Justice and Rights Coalition, um, the OECD, um, for anyone on this group that's been working on illicit financial flows, knows how unequal you know, the global governance of economic, of e the economic landscape is globally in the huge part that OECD has in making sure that, that that landscape is completely unequal. So I question that. I also question the inclusion of um, this U new UN agency, or U UNCDF, um, and their tagline is unlocking public and private finance for the poor. Um, members who've been in the economic justice movement will know that there's a huge pushback from feminist organizations, women's rights organizations in the global south, specifically in Africa, against what the World Bank is calling maximizing finance for development. A lot of our debt is now with private creditors and what does that mean when, you, when you're when you working with a UN agency whose mandate is to make sure you're pushing this idea of private finance for development. Um, Public-private fi uh, public fi um, partnerships are being pushed down our throats but is what is really causing a lot of our debt to increase and also has a direct impact on the quality of lives of women and African um, women and girls of the continent. So I question that and I think there needs to be room to question the fundamentals of this coalition. Again, the Gates Foundation and their role in intellectual property rights and their role in making sure that intellectual property rights do not work for the continent of Africa. They are the
HIV and the pandemic around the HIV scourge, for example. So I question what, what this means and how we can sit around a table. And even if we are sitting around the table, what does it mean? And what does it mean in terms of power structures between us and who gets to say anything? And is this just really whoever can bankroll you and women that gets a seat at the table? And what is our role in validating or not validating this narrative that is being constantly pushed? I really, really, really caution against this public-private finance mechanism. Yes, there can be elements of it that are positive, but again, when you're looking at private, who is private? And are we just talking about multinationals or are we growing our own private industry in continent and in country? And so if you look at, if you do an analysis of who public-private partnerships include, most of them will not, actually 99% of them will not be national or local African organizations. Overlay that with illicit financial flows, and this is the very same organizations that are finding loopholes in our systems, in our legislation, in our policies to get the money out. The same money, $100 billion of which leaves the continent that could be invested in, you know, the advancement of, of quality and dignity of lives for women and girls. So my really my questions are around the fundamentals of the group and how power structures um, play out in the group and really what our fundamental position is. And I volunteer to help structure a position paper for this group just so that we're, we make sure that we're on the same page and that we're really questioning these fundamentals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Len, from Zone. That there is actually a virtual clap that you can do on on the <laughs> on the Zoom. So I think you you really have raised uh, uh, some critical uh, issues around the legitimacy us being there and what's our is our role uh, in that group with with a lot of power dynamic. Because again, when we apply, when this process started, all of us applied. You don't. Uh, you don't know who you'll end up being or who will end up being uh, selected as leaders. Now that we know who are the leaders, what, uh, what, what is our, our sense and uh, what is the reflection of the leadership, the choices. So I think it's, it's, it's a, relevant question, a relevant question on uh, questioning not only the outcome or what we would want to see because the means also may justify the end depending on people you have in the leadership can justify what kind of the output that is if, uh, will come out of the process. So it is a legitimate question to look at the, the structure and the process. And I think this is what we are set to do in the next session. I don't know if uh, memory wants to respond to any of those. Uh, if not, I think the next section, which we are going to go to the breakout group, we are going to respond to those critical questions on what needs to be done now that we found ourselves in the leadership of action coalition and economic justice with a number of members that potentially don't share politics with potentially there is uh, uh, antagonistic politics how should we uh, position ourselves and what kind of support that uh, feminine will need to, to ensure that we stand for the rights of african women and girls and uh, etc etc so if memory you don't have anything to respond i'll hand it over to right to take us to the working group so that we can try to answer this fundamental question that has been tabled in this platform. Yeah, um, thanks, Mitch. And I think this is this is one thing that we are also, I mean, just to add and say, the reason why we are also having this convening is to actually, first of all, just share the information because we've realized that there's a lot of power dynamics already playing out in terms of how information is just for a particular group of people who have access. So we want to actually start disrupting that and start sharing information, but also getting information and having a very firm position as coming from African feminists to say, what exactly do we want? And just not only for economic justice um, action coalition, but also across the other action coalitions, but to start to say at least where we, where we are in the leadership, how do we position ourselves? How do we also position ourselves so that we have voice and we are also able to, to really um, put specific demands and ask for specific rights and to actually start questioning and start challenging um, all those. So I think um, Crystal Interfazwa, your, 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 your comments and your, 
your concerns are just exactly the kind of things that we want to put together as a collective so that it also comes out in terms of what exactly are we pushing, what exactly will be our vision in terms of our role as FemNet, because we really want to be distinct and say, as FemNet, what exactly are we going to push? So we really welcome, um, we really welcome all your inputs and also welcoming you to say um, everything that you will, you'll be supporting us with. Okay, so Rachel, yeah. I think we also have an issue around time, so yes, kind of ask yes. for your indulgence. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mishi. Thank you, Memory. And yes, great, great conversations and great questions. Great questions we are already starting to think. We want to go into breakaway, uh, breakout uh, group sessions. I have just posted the two, you know, conversation starters for uh, our breakaway groups. One will be asking ourselves, what do we hope will come from the generation equality and the action on coalition process? Um, and, and when we say hope, I think we need to capture all our hope, our disappointments, everything, the confusion that we see and, you know, what it is that we'd want to envision within the whole process. But then secondly, we'd also be asking ourselves, how would we want to be involved? How would we want to be uh, engaged? And, and I take note of what Crystal has already shared in terms of, you know, even just volunteering to start drafting uh, the position paper that we can, we can be able to collectively um, work with. So, in a few minutes, I hope that's clear. Just two, just two reflections. Uh, once you find in your group, just quickly huddle it together. Um, let anyone volunteer, whoever is in the group, to lead the conversation. And then within 10 minutes, we will be coming back to just to wrap up and close up the, the session we are aiming for. Um, um, maybe also requesting we end at least, uh, we're hoping to end at 4.30, maybe requesting that we can end at 4.40 at the latest. So I'm I, I hope I hope the conversations um, <laughs> were able to hold those conversations despite the limitations of time. Um, Ten minutes can look like a very long time, and then when you start, it becomes very short a time. But really, really to appreciate that, like I said, they were for starter conversation, and it's a conversation that we look forward that you know we'll continue having even in the coming days, in the coming weeks. Allow me just to randomly just request the different groups. If there's anything that's you know standing out um, in terms of a priority, in terms of an area of focus, in terms of any volunteers would want to engage them, be involved in the action coalition, if we can just do a quick you know feedback session um, in this in this plenary, I would be requesting the different groups. So I'll just say group one, and then I'll see if there's any hand that's been raised, and I'll be giving you the floor. If you can kindly just take a minute. Uh, so that we can be able just to have all the four, five different groups just, you know, giving us snippets of what's coming up from those conversations. So group one, I would love to find out from group one. I know Dorothy, Dr. Asfu, um, I think Dawn, Emily and Zona, you're in group one. Anyone who wants to just quickly just do a snippet of, you know, what's two things or three things that are coming out from that discussion. Emily was, was going to do it. Okay, Emily, I see your hands. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, Rochelle already mentioned some of the members of our group. We had Dorothy, Dr. McCulling, um, Dr. Amani, Zones, and Diana, and Elisa. Yes, I think I get everyone's name right. So we spoke about involving our government and private stakeholders in the processes to ensure that women have access to rights to own um, economic businesses, get um, contracts that they can implement that can create financial wealth for them. We also mentioned that we should collect data at the uh, maybe a baseline data of which laws are existing already and how are they affect, um, ensuring that women can have access to contracts, uh, finances to implement contracts um, we shared basically a lot of situations per country and also looked at where we can have collaborations. We had a member who was attending as for the first time, I think like several others like myself, who asked about how to be more engaged in the action.
how do we know what is happening in our different countries and how do we get involved and also how to build capacity of the grassroots women because in most countries the laws already exist I think we are losing you, Emily. Where is she? But, yeah, but I think I think we get we get a grasp of of the key the key discussions around the involvement of the government, um, data collection very critical around existing laws, um, and then I think you're talking about the capacities, the enhancement of capacities at the local level. Um, maybe I can move on to group two. I I kind of feel like um, your connection looks a little bit shaky. If we can quickly just move into group two. Anyone who was going to represent group two? I know in group two we had Caroline, we had Esther, we had Cecilia. Just a minute, just one minute, just to give us a feel of, you know, the conversations that you had. Caroline Vengo. Or maybe we can move to group three <laughs> as, as you come together as group two. Maybe group three. Group three, I know we had memory. We had Sylvia, we had Julia, and we had Helen. Yes, Julie. Julie, maybe you can have the, 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 the you can take the space now. Julie? You're muted. Sorry, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry, just noticed that. Um, in group three, we talked about seeing young women activists more engaged in the whole process. Uh, this is because the young women, they bring out a different perspective since they are there on the ground. So by getting them involved, we'll, we, we, we'll get to know uh, what's going on. And then also one of the desired outcomes is women are owning property, women are able to make financial decisions, which not only Benef which benefit them and also different members of the society. Um, and then we're also looking at women and girls being able to make decisions on their own. And this um, involves also making economic decisions and empowerment of women in this process is, is, is key. You know, letting women be part of the planning process, engage, engaging them, um, basically involving young women and girls right from the beginning. When we are starting a process, we make sure that everybody is on, is on board. And also, we looked at statistics. The, this conversation is not being involved. I mean, uh, based on the statistics, we see that the conversation has not been covered widely. Uh, it's important that we create avenues to have conversations so that we can empower or rather we can reach many women, be it young, be it old, and also use various channels. Um, for instance, like adolescent girls, we use instructors, we use their teachers, uh, grassroots involved women, younger women, okay. or older women, and okay. also explore the digital world. Thank you. Okay, okay. okay. Very good, very good, because like I said, uh, it's just snippets we're giving and we will give more details um, um, from, from the, 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 the groups that we've had. If we can, I can quickly just invite group number four. Uh, group number four, I know Mary Lise was there. <laughs> uh, one or two snippets that's coming up from your conversation, Mary Lise, from group four. So uh, in our group, in regard to the first question, one of the voices and in this case yeah. okay. most of these uh, platforms have uh, youth in anglophone and francophone countries being engaged but youth that come from countries that speak Portuguese for instance are not hugely engaged and if we are speaking about women and economic justice then what can we be able to do to ensure that all women are included in this regard and then the issue of adolescent girls as well came up uh, in regards to how can they be engaged given as these uh, these uh, these processes happen in very high level platforms and mm -hmm. uh, 
the time. So how can we create a platform where these girls are also engaged? Because uh, we have, yes, but they are, they are little by little transitioning from school to, uh, to the world where they have to have access to everything that would allow them. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, issues around adolescent and, and, and adolescent girls, yeah, very, very critical. I think I want to check with group two. Caroline, uh, anyone from group two? And we had a group, group which was on plenary, virtual. Yes, yes, yes. I'm Cecilia from Tanzania. Uh, in group two, we look on the awareness on how we can create consciousness to all women, since this is about leaving no one behind. We also look as the great participants of women. We don't want to see them as beneficiary when it comes to this. We want them to be involved effectively. But to analyze the gaps that happen on the preparation of the Beijing Plus 25, the reports of the country, we understand that different countries have the process and we want to like women to be involved in more and see what's happening in past and know how to tackle this now. And yeah. also the last thing is learning from other countries. We understand that there are countries who have started the process already. So is I think is the time for us to to learn from them so that we can know how we can do better in our countries. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um I think also group five. Um uh, is where I had put you, Mishi, the group that was meeting in the plenary. Uh, who's going to be representing your group? Yourself? I think American. Another Mary. Ooh, Mary Lee? <laughs> yes. Yes. I think we talked uh, quite a number of things. Uh, one, I remember very well, we talked about the importance of localizing the whole process uh, and, uh, and making sure that uh, we bring on board other like-minded organizations and especially grassroots uh, voices must be heard. Uh, mm -hmm. Also connecting with, uh, with the country offices, UN uh, women country offices. And also somebody talked about, um, yeah, uh, you know, importance of bottom-up process. Yeah. Uh, a deliberate move to capacity build grassroots uh, organizations and making sure that they are fully involved. And um, uh, making also sure that after some time when evaluation is done, uh, to make sure that we see more uh, Africans uh, antro, antro, uh, what did she say? Uh, you, you know, funders are also becoming uh, from Africa, not always to wait for others from outside. So, yeah, I think this is what I remember. Yeah, great. In case I forgot something. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to everyone and the different groups. Um, we really wish we had a little bit more of time so that we can even just unpack and delve. But I think by and large, what you're saying is that it's a process that we want to see more transparency, uh, more meaningful engagement by us as, as women rights activists in our different countries, but then also largely um, um, at, at the continental level, uh, particularly engagement of the young women, the adolescent girls, very critical, and how we can also tap in and explore uh, digital and, 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 and the use of digital even within the financial inclusion conversations. Um, I think we're also saying how do we uh, make sure that there's awareness creation so that as many, as many of the constituencies that we work with, uh, there's an awareness in terms of uh, the whole process of the action coalition and the generation equality, but particularly the entry points uh, in terms of how and who do we need to influence. So whether working with the UN women in their country offices or with our government, but then being able to identify who is it that we need to influence, um, even at this stage where there's a lot of crafting, there's a lot of co-creation that's already happening. We will continue to have this conversation. 
uh, but I want to pause here again in the interest of time because I had already requested for you to extend with a few more minutes. And I just want then just to hand over to memory, uh, just to give us a wrap up. And, and then we'll be sharing the presentation as, as already alluded to, and also the recording from uh, our webinar this afternoon. Feel free to keep reaching out to us um, for any uh, information, any ideas, any way that we can be able to continue to caucus together uh, and make sure that the, the, the conversations are really meaningful and our voices are included. Welcome, Memory. Excuse me, before Memory comes in, yes. just a quick, quick reminder of a question that came up in our group, asking how different coalitions, organizations, whether you have a strategy on how you are going to engage uh, your different partners. I gave an example of like, if uh, Care International is part of the coalition and eventually comes to its partners at the local level, have you thought on how eventually this can be the collaboration? Because at the end of the day, when we are talking about strengthening our African, uh, uh, strengthening our feminine membership and strengthening the African voice, how are we eventually going to be able to collaborate with those other partners who might eventually also bring up the whole conversation again uh, with the different organizations that they support? So if memory probably can also give us some ideas or if we can, you know, strategize on how we are going to be able to manage that. I think that will be very interesting to hear. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Rach. Can I come in? Okay. So I think just to thank everyone, and I think uh, Mary, what you've just raised, this is exactly the starting point in terms of our strategizing on how we are going to be engaging. So we, we have a working group, and we hope with this working group, uh, we want to have working groups for each of the action coalitions. So and a working group which will put together the Africa demands for ending gender-based violence, feminist movement building, climate justice. So we want to make sure that all, all, all our members are part, depending on their area of interest, they are part of each of the working group and that they can input directly um, to those action coalitions. And we'll be making sure that we'll constantly be sharing um, as much information as we can and we'll be getting in touch with you. And we're also inviting you to give us ideas We'll be coming, we'll be putting together a position paper on economic justice and rights. And we'll also have a collective uh, position paper on influencing all the different um, action coalitions. So we'll be really coming to you for your input and to really, um, really, really ask you to support this process and just get to us, um, just let us know if, if you also want to have something at a national level, if your president, for example, or your country is one of the countries, we also want to engage and to also influence them. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll come up with, um, with our strategy in terms of how we want to engage and we'll share it with you and also ask for your input. So having said that, I really want to thank um, everyone for who has actually extended time to be on this call. I know we've gone way, way, way beyond, but everyone has been engaged. Everyone has said, yeah, we are so, you know, this is, a, this is a time where we are saying, we want to be on that table. We want to disrupt. We want to challenge the powers. And we want to bring the voice of African women to make sure that this process, which is really a global process, is actually like a new way to engage and to build momentum and leverage on the Beijing process, but to also bring in um, uh, the, the, the young generation and to have that intergenerational. So we want to be part of that process. We want you to be part of that process and we hope we'll be able to work together and to get your input. And please feel free I've, I've already seen people volunteering to be in this in, in the different working group. So please um, just let us know. We'll be sending uh, emails to you and also asking for your in inputs. But more and more, we really want to support and to work with you to take this to the national level, to take this to the community level. 
will also be connecting you in countries with UN women and even in countries without UN women. We really want to move this and be robust. You know, we are the African women. We really want to push for this. We want our voices to be heard and we want to make sure that we are there. So thank you so much. Thanks to Zone. Uh, thanks to Dr. Amani. Thanks to each and everyone, uh, who, everyone who's joined us from, from the Gambia, from Mozambique, from Kenya, from Rwanda, Uganda, everyone who has joined us today. Thank you so much. Thanks also to the, to the FemNet team. Uh, Rachel Kagoya will be our contact person in FemNet if you want anything on Action Coalition. And there'll be support also from uh, Mishi, from Helen, from Julie, and from Sylvia, and everyone from the FemNet team. So once again, thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening.